So welcome everyone to our iNaturalist training session. So my name is Ellie and I'm here with Stu. We're both from the Natural History Consortium and we're delighted to be joined by Jen today, who is the UK Conservation Manager at Bristol Zoological Society and is going to be telling us a bit about how she uses wildlife surveys um, at, at the zoo and at Wild Place. So really delighted to have you here. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Ellie. So I was just going to start by telling you a little bit about um, City Nature Challenge and then we're going to pass over to Jen and then Stu's going to show you how to use iNaturalist on your app and on the browser too. So I'm just going to share some slides. So as I mentioned, we're from the Natural History Consortium and we're a collaboration between these 14 organisations, including, including Bristol Zoological Society. And together we organise the Bristol and Bath City Nature Challenge. So City Nature Challenge is a global initiative to try to collect as much wildlife data as possible. So it was it's organised by California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And they started it as a competition between themselves in 2016. Um, but then in 2018, they opened it up to um, cities across the world to take part. This is the first time that Bristol and Bath took part. Um, and all of those cities collect wildlife observations using the platform iNaturalist. And Stu's gonna explain a bit more about that a bit later on this morning. So I'm not going to read all these stats here, but I just want to point out a couple of them. So um, last year, 244 city regions took part and they managed to collect over 815,000 wildlife observations. So last year in Bristol and Bath, we had 550 residents that took part collecting over 9,000 wildlife observations, which is pretty impressive considering we're in proper lockdown and people can only leave their house for an hour at a time um, during the day. On the right, this is a map of our region um, taken from iNaturalist. So this is our last year's project page. As you can see, our region kind of spreads into North Somerset and as far west as Western Supermare. Um, so it doesn't just cover the Bristol and Bath region, rather um, it kind of covers the local environmental record centre area. And you'll notice as well, there's a kind of strange hook that goes up into Gloucestershire as well. And that's so that we can incorporate um, our partners at the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, so up at Slimbridge there as well. And all of these red dots in our area are the wildlife records that were, that were taken. So this year, the challenge is taking place from tomorrow to Monday, the 3rd of May. And during those four days, um, over 400 cities across the world are going to be collecting wildlife data, including 14 city regions in the UK. So these are the different areas in the UK taking part. And, and this year, like last year, because of the pandemic, the competition element has been dropped from the challenge. So um, instead, we're just trying to, trying to encourage as many people as possible to take part. And it's enabled us as well to work more closely with those UK cities. So we've got a UK City Nature Challenge page, which is the link down the bottom, which has lots of resources from those different cities um, and how-to guides and lots of information about how to get involved as well. So why take part in City Nature Challenge? I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because I think Jen is going to do a much better job of um, speaking about wildlife surveys and recording. But I just wanted to note um, how important it is to, to be collecting this wildlife data. So um, it really helps us gain an understanding of how species might be declining or bouncing back in certain areas. 
um, and a lot of that data is recorded by citizen scientists and volunteers. And it can really help to inform conservation, um, land management, um, so it, it is really useful. We also encourage as many people to take part as possible because of the wonderful health benefits there are being out in nature. And also using iNaturalist through the challenge is a really accessible way to be recording wildlife data. So you don't need to be an expert. You just have to um, have a camera or a phone, take photos of wildlife, and the app will help you um, help you to name that species. It's a really useful learning tool. And also as part of the app, people will make suggestions on what that species is as well. Um, and Stu will explain a bit more about that app a bit later on. I'm gonna stop there and pass over to you, Jen. So I'll stop my slides. And I'll, I'll hand over to you. How's that working? Can you see that? Yes, perfectly. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Ellie. I'm Jen, and I've been the UK Conservation Manager at Bristol Zoological Society for quite a long time now. Um, and today I'm going to mainly focus on Wild Place and what we do there because it's very relevant uh, to the City Nature Challenge, and we've also hosted Bristol um, Fire Blitzes um, at our site as well in partnership. Um, with Ellie and co. And so my talk today, it's going to be a little brief talk and we'll do some questions and answers at the end of it. But I'm going to basically cover, um, I'm going to talk do an introduction to Wild Place, um, which is the sister zoo to uh, Bristol Zoo Gardens. I'm going to talk a little bit about our native species strategy because that will help put it in context why we do surveys. Uh, then I'll talk about what surveys we do what data we collect and how what we do with this data, why it's important, and then just do a little sum up at the end, um, just to kind of hopefully put it into the wider picture for you. So what is Wild Place? Where is it? Well, um, I should, well, I don't know if you all know where it is, but it's northern Bristol, so it's kind of quite near Cribs Causeway. Um, and it's actually, uh, it's, its full proper title is the Hollywood Towers Estate. And it's a 55 hectare site uh, with a mosaic of habitats. Um, we've got a mansion house in the middle of it. And in 2013, we opened it as a visitor attraction with a few exhibits and a lot of kind of nice wild habitats to explore. Um, before that, we owned it for a long time and historically it's been for extra animals that wouldn't quite fit in the Clifton site. Um, and also our horticultural team and we grew a lot of our fodder crops there. Um, and that was before it was opened officially as a visitor attraction, um, as, as a kind of uh, partnership to the Bristol Zoo Gardens. Now within it, we've got several, well, we've got lots of different habitats and quite exciting ones, um, but we've kind of prioritized four key habitats. Uh, woodland, because we've got, we're the site of an ancient woodland. And although when we took it over, it was predominantly sycamore, we are working uh, to restore it to its um, former glory. Uh, we've got wetlands, uh, so we've got a large area called Webb's Break, and quite a few his, uh, little satellite ponds around. Uh, meadow verges, we've got some nice, um, good indicator meadow species um, in some of our edges and around our grassland areas and hedgerows as well, a very um, important focus, especially as part of uh, nature networks. And we've got some really nice old uh, hedgerows, which are important because they've got a really good mix of native species within them. So that's Wild Place and what do we do? So we set out about developing a strategy for it, a native species strategy. Now this sounds quite grand, but we decided that it was really important to have this strategy in place to make sure that as we develop it and put in enclosures with non, not necessarily native species in there, that we do this sympathetically to the biodiversity, the habitat and species that are in place there. So one of my first sort of remits when we, um, when we opened it was to make sure that we had these strategies. So we're on our second strategy at the moment that runs to 2023 
and um, I want to talk to you a little bit about that because it will help contextualize um, why we have the surveys and why we do it. So there's five key strategic aims within this um, within our strategy and the first one is monitoring so that's our surveys and that's what I'm going to focus on today but there are other elements to our strategy the mitigation is important to make sure that when we develop these new exhibits and these new buildings that we work with our wildlife and that if we are going to move things that we make sure that we enhance and benefit and improve their habitat rather than diminish it we're a lot about restoration. So before we kind of opened it to the public, we hadn't done much to it. We sort of just let it get on and do its own thing. So we're trying to do some restoration again, really sympathetically. A lot of it's that focused on wetlands because um, if you leave a wetland long enough, it would just revert to woodland. Um, and it's important to have a nice mix of all these different habitats. We're very much about communication. Here I am today chatting to you a lot about talking to people about pro-conservation behavior, what they can do to help and benefit wildlife and habitats. And of course, any strategy has got to be sustainable long-term. You can't develop something and then not have the resources to carry it out. So as I say today, because it's all about surveys, we're gonna focus on number one, and that's our long-term monitoring program. So what are the, what's the aim of this? Well, basically to make sure what we've got on site, have we got notable, have we got priority species? Have we got invasive species that need removing? And this will also validate any conservation that we do for it. If you survey, if you know, if you can see your baseline and then what happens in the future, you can work out if it's working what you're doing. And the action here is not just about long-term monitoring, but also about developing research programs. We're very lucky at Bristol Zoological Society to run several undergraduate, masters and PhD degrees. And so we have a wealth of um, different students with lots of different skill sets that can help us with our data collection and also with extra research. So a lot of this long-term monitoring also has a background of um, research going on in the, as well. Why do we survey? Well, I think you're going to really know by the end of it why we survey. Obviously, we want to know about the species. We want to know what we've got. We, it's really important. So we're building all this new, new exhibits. We need to know what we're building on. If we can build there, we have to build it sympathetically. We need to make sure that we, um, whatever we do, that it's done with a positive effect to our native species. And it's our baseline, having a really good basis of what's there and how we are going to do to improve it. We don't just want to know what species and what habitats we've got, but actually how to improve them in the future. So it's a really important element and it underpins all of our work um, in terms of our field work. So what do we do at um, Wild Place? Well, we had, so before we opened in 2013, we had a very extensive planning phase and that obviously entailed having a great deal of ecological surveys. Surveys, not just on our woodland, but our grassland, our hedgerows, native species, ground flora, all of it to build up a picture of what we had, what habitats, what species, what were priority concerns. So we went to the experts. And then from 2012, consistently, we've been running badger and amphibian surveys. We've got a lot of wetland areas and we knew we had resident badgers on site. Now, as a zoological society with lots of rare hoof stock, we knew it was important to set up a vaccination programme. So we've been running a vaccination programme before we opened since 2012, recognising that a healthy badger is more likely to keep poorly badgers out of the site. And since we've opened, we started doing quite a few bird surveys, some transects, but it wasn't until 2018 when we really, we employed some dedicated staff and we could do a baseline data set. And then emerged the big historical Wild Wednesday. So every Wednesday, we meet with our team of volunteers, local experts and dedicated zoo staff, and off we trot around the site doing specific surveys. Um, and they're all tailored to the time of year and what might be out and about. So this looks kind of crazy, but this is uh, one of our, just to show you a spreadsheet of the sort of things we do. So um, this is our lovely team, Holly and Neil. Um, they basically, Holly loves a good spreadsheet. So she pops it all in there. So you can see that right throughout the year, we do a bird transect at dawn, uh, because obviously you've got those winter migrants, you've got the summer species, you've got those spring, 
ones that will suddenly reappear. So it's really nice and important to have it all through the year. For some species, they're not really around um, between uh, the winter time. So a lot of it, it really starts for us in spring, runs through to autumn. And the winter is kind of more about restoration projects and habitat management um, rather than um, doing that many surveys. So just to run through a few of the surveys and what we do, um, I'm aware that we haven't got a huge amount of time, uh, but just to give you a little bit of a taster. So with our bird surveys, as I say, they run through the entire year. And um, basically we do um, not just, uh, we do transects, but we also do nest box checks and we ring our chicks as well. So we've got um, over 20 different nest box sites um, and we've got licensed, um, uh, ornithologists on site to check both check the nest box and also to run the birds to get a nice data set to see who's resident um, around the site and you can see from that that's a little map at the top there and that's just to show that's a kind of level it's a GS map from Holly just to show the kind of diversity and the abundance and you can see that kind of the woodland area that's where the sort of red area is is a really good diverse species um, area for uh, birds. And then going on to bats, and I know that Karis is here today, so it's a big thank you to Karis, um, who has taken on board our bat surveys. And Karis basically does lots of, she walks around with her bat detector. We've got a static on site as well. And we've also had university students, both from the University of Bristol and West of England. And there was a really nice study that they did a couple of years ago, over 51 nights with static detectors. And we found at least 10 bat species there. And we've got lots of, um, good species, including the rarer ones, such as uh, horseshoe bats and long-eared bats. And we've also got some barbastars as well. And uh, we're determined to find them in the uh, clock tower. Uh, Karis has seen them flying around, um, but with so far we haven't any identified any major roosts, but we have got bat boxes all around the site and uh, we keep hoping we'll find a roost or maybe we can develop. I'd still like to build a cave for them, but a very important site for bats. Um, which is exciting and also validates why we do a lot of our wetland research because bats need water. And then we move to small mammals. So um, now this is one of my absolute favorites. I really like yellow necked mice. I will admit that they make me really quite excited. I also really like water shoes, but they're quite hard to find at Wild Place. We, we know we have seen them historically, although no one believes me because we haven't found them since. But with the Longworths, we certainly, we use these small Longworth traps and uh, we have got quite a nice abundant population of the usual uh, field voles, um, but we also, and wood mice, but we also have yellow neck mice as well, which makes me smile each year. And then mammal tunnels. So the bigger animals that won't quite fit in the longworths, we use these mammal tunnels where you basically bait uh, a tunnel with uh, usually kind of cat food. You've got some blotting paper and ink. Uh, you can choose what color, uh, we go for purple. And, um, and then you look to see what you've got. And this one really the focus here is hedgehogs. We want to, we know we've got hedgehogs on site. We're really trying to work out which habitats, where they, how they're utilizing the site and how we can improve that connectivity for them. So it's all about maintaining wildlife corridors um, so that they've got their migration routes um, on site. And that is a hedgehog uh, footprint, uh, just to show that we do have them. <laughs> And then dormice. So we haven't had positive sightings of dormice yet, despite our best valiant efforts. And we've basically had uh, both nest, site, nest tubes and footprint tunnels uh, for dormice on site plus camera traps. And basically, we still haven't um, had a positive one, although we do have um, a lot of hazel understory. We do have good potential habitat for them. We know they're in nearish in, in an area of Bristol nearby. Um, and so we're still hunting for them. Uh, whether we have them, if we do, they're probably a very small population, in which case then we would need to restore them and work with the habitat to extend it for them. And camera trapping. This is a really vital part of what we do. So it's a really important element because it helps show so many other species. We have lots of camera traps and we keep them running throughout the year and they can be really important because especially when you're setting maybe your mammal tunnels or you're setting your badger traps 
um, or you've got your um, dormice boxes up, it gives you a much bigger picture of what's out there. And um, we know that we've got quite a large fox population. We know that we've got two different groups. So we've got one that kind of nests and breeds outside and then sneaks in. And then we've got another dominant group. Um, and we've kind of, we had a student last year have a look at them and she identified 23 different foxes. Uh, so they've all got different names. Um, and yeah, we, we <laughs> they're quite, so this is a, a, a young cub uh, in the left-hand uh, picture, basically going into my badger trap and setting it off when I was supposed to be catching badgers. So they are quite wily and they're quite cheeky. And, and every time you turn around, you'll see cubs in the spring playing behind you. Um, and obviously we get gray squirrels posing for always on the camera traps, which um, makes us grin quite a lot. And then this is just to show you, and you could just, this was our exciting one. This is a woodcock. So we haven't seen, uh, we haven't identified woodcocks in our bird surveys, but you can see here, we've got a woodcock and then we've got a tawny owl as well. So it's really nice when they pick up different species. Um, there's, our, there's our badgers being uh, cheeky as usual um, in the, our little set that we've got. And then at the bottom there, you've got a uh, young roe deer as well. So we pick up a nice variety of species from the camera traps. And then badgers, so as I said, we, we started in 2012. So this is both badger trapping and vaccinating. Uh, so our vets on site, we call them out when we catch a badger and we vaccinate them and we chip them. And that gives us an idea of kind of what's, um, what, what's on site and um, basically how they are doing. So it's a kind of visual check and a vaccination program. And that's, that runs alongside. So although we don't have a major set, we do have an outlier set. Um, so it's important that we make sure that they're healthy each year. And then reptiles. So we've got, we haven't identified adders on site, but we have a very healthy population of uh, grass snakes and slow worms. So we have, um, and we've identified the key areas within wild place where they like to nest and breed. And so obviously that's super important when you are, um, when we're building or developing to make sure that these prime habitats for these species are kept and preserved as well. And we do these surveys by, by uh, putting down mats and checking mats and doing and walking the same transect each, each year. Uh, a lot of it is transect based where you will walk the same area so that you can build up that re repeatability of what you're doing. And I would urge all those budding naturalists out there to, to, to work on that sort of basis to try and keep consistency in your data in the way you data collect and the way um, and who does it if possible just because then it's more a little bit more reliable for you and amphibians we're doing a lot of pond restoration work um, to make sure that we've got these wonderful wetland areas and we look at and we uh, we basically do our amphibian surveys each year to get a handle of uh, what newts we've got, whether we've got our toads and our frogs on site. So we do this consistently and we've been doing this before we even opened since 2012. And this ties in very much with aquatic invertebrates and that will give you a really, a, the invertebrates are great because you will only have those really important species like mayflies if your water quality is good. So they're a good indicator of if you're doing your restoration work well. So we basically did a before, before and after scores of what, um, what kind of health it was looking at the numbers of invertebrates and the types of species. And I'm delighted to say that since we've been doing our restoring, um, our yeah, invertebrates have gone up, our aquatic invertebrates have gone up considerably. And now a lot of these ponds are really coming into good health with some exciting new dragonfly, damselfly and mayfly species in there. And obviously the terrestrial invertebrates. So we do a variety of pitfall traps. We do uh, we do um, bashing of bushes uh, where you collect them out. We do sweep netting, um, collect them onto sheets and then spend hours with our really dedicated team of entomologists looking and identifying all the different species from bees to hoverflies to the beetles and to dung beetles. And we have at least five species of dung beetle, which has made us very excited indeed. And then not, obviously we also do our ground flora as well and our, we do our botanical surveys. And this one, the ground flora here, this one's uh, quite important for bare wood. So since we've put in uh, some historic species like 
bears and lynx and wolverines. We decided it would be really important to look at how they utilize it. So we did baselines, ground flora surveys before and during and after the animals were put in. And we'll be monitoring this for at least 15 years, looking at where the pathways have been raised up to see how the recovery is without any trampling on the ground and also what the animals do to their enclosures and how the biodiversity changes over time. So it's a really nice, we've got 10 quadrats where we are monitoring every single month where, where possible with uh, obviously um, pandemics sometimes scupper that slightly um, to get a really good idea of how our habitat is changing over time. And then if it's a positive change, that's great. If it's negative, then we can work appropriately to make sure that abundance isn't compromised. Now, so why, and then what do we do with all this data? We've got this wonderful data collection. Every year we have many, many spreadsheets of lots of different data. And that's when we work really closely with our lo local record center. So in our case, it's the Bristol Regional Environmental Record Center, and they are fabulous. Tim Corner is a very patient man. Um, and what we do is we send all our records to them. They, that gets um, loaded up to the National Biodiversity Network. And why is this important? Well, they use our records, they get to know what we've got, but also we can use their records. And this is really important. So this isn't just for here, but for any of our projects, going to your uh, local record center to find out what species used to be there, or where, it's where there are fragmented populations that maybe need saving. And so it helps you build up your picture and work out. And it's especially relevant for say, uh, things like rewilding at the moment, which obviously is a very hot topic. Um, the, the kind of basic advice is if you want to rewild, go to your record center, find out what was there in the, in the originally, and then work out where it would be appropriate to restore or indeed introduce species. So it's vital without knowing that, you don't know whether a reintroduction is appropriate or an introduction to a novel area. So it really underpins all of our, um, all of our projects. The first thing is to do that desktop study to find out. And that's where uh, the public and citizen science really comes into play because your records are super valuable because it helps us tell us where we need to best focus our conservation um, effort and how to prioritize that. And that underpins all of our projects. So we don't just work in the UK, we work all around the world. And it is absolutely, so basically our surveys underpin everything. Everything is science-based, what we do at the zoo. We've got a great team of uh, specialist scientists and all of our projects, the key thing that we'll start with is identifying what's at risk, what's there, and what, how we best preserve it. So without surveys, we wouldn't have any of these projects um, actually on the ground. So just to sum up, sorry, I think I went a little bit over time and I really apologize. I've tried to go as speedy as I can, but I'm not known for keeping it um, concise. And Ellie did say it didn't really matter too much. Um, <laughs> so just to sum up, so we have basically at Wild Place, we have this native species strategy and that underpins all of our work. But one of the key elements of that is to do our surveys to make sure that we work with the biodiversity on site. We send all our records to the local record center that gets um, updated to the national, I'm um, sorry, up, uploaded to the national database. And our key aim, our overarching aim for this site, even though we are developing it um, and both zoos are moving together, is to make sure that we don't just conserve, but we actually increase and expand our, our biodiversity and also talk to everybody about this pro-conservation behavior, how you can do your little bit and rewild your own small um, area or large area and we're happy to support you with that and just to say that surveys it's so important and it underpins all of our conservation projects uh, globally thank you that's me and i'm done thank you very much that was brilliant thanks so much jen it's fantastic to hear about your work it sounds like you're very with your team you're incredibly busy <laughs> Uh, well, it's my team do most of it. I just sit around in my office and uh, look at spreadsheets. 
Um, but yeah, no, they're, they're a fabulous. Um, and I, I would love to just a big shout out to Holly uh, and Neil and Karis as well, and Rosie as well, because they all work, they're all fundamental. In fact, the whole team is, is great at kind of being involved and doing the survey work. And, and actually what works really well is the rangers as well when we do the talks, because they've got the eyes and ears on the ground. So it's really nice. We sort of say, you know, what's on the ground, what species are around at the moment, and they'll put them on the blackboard. And then as people come around, the, the um, the, the visitors, the guests will, will also tell us what they've seen and then we really build up a bigger picture and we have a diary where people can note down what they've seen and we're always getting fantastic um, photos from the volunteers and the staff about the species they've seen on site. So it's really, it's a really big kind of combined effort from us all really uh, feeding into getting a really good handle on what's there. I mean, we've only touched the surface really. We've still got a lot of bits to explore, but so every year we sort of prioritize different habitats to look at. Amazing. Sounds really exciting. It's brilliant. It's like it's like um it's like working in a big kind of adventure playground. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's such it, it, yeah, it's such a gift and it's such a joy to work for this organization and and have this responsibility. It's it's fab. <laughs> Before we move on to um, explaining a bit about how you use iNaturalist and how you can use it over the next four days, does anybody have any questions for Jen? Silence. <laughs> I can maybe it's the, I can pause the recording if that makes people more um, more comfortable. I'm going to do that. Thumbs up. Is this now showing my screen? Fantastic. Cool. Um, so uh, this is my mobile, obviously, um, and I'm just going to quickly go through how to use iNaturalist um, using a mobile device and also how to use it um, using a desktop as well. Um, so first thing to note is that I'm using an Android phone as well. Um, um, sorry, I'm not using an Android phone. I'm using an Apple phone. It's different if you're using an Android phone, but only slightly. So um, during this, if anyone has any questions uh, or anything looks different, really do just shout out or drop them in the chat for Ellie to shout out to me because um, uh, I don't want to confuse things further. <laughs> um, so just quickly to download the app, if uh, you just head to the App Store, if you're using an Apple phone and if you're using an Android device, just head to the Google Play Store type in iNaturalist, it should be one of the first ones that comes up, um, and then hit uh, download there. Mine says open because it already exists on my phone. First screen that will come up is um, a list of observations that you've made, which if you've downloaded it for the first time, um, it will just have zero observations. Um, and so you, here you can see all of the records I've made um, across Bristol and Bath um, and London. Uh, because I was in lockdown in London last year, um, over the last three years. At the bottom of the screen, we've got explore, activity, observe, me, and more. Um, and if you're using an Android device, there'll be a big green circle with a plus symbol in it, which is the same as the observe button on a uh, iPhone. So I'm just going to do a quick records now. Um, so if I click observe, uh, going from right to left, we've got record sound, camera roll, camera, no photo. Um, so record sounds um, will be for like birdsong, for example. Um, if you click on that, you'll see that like a quick recording type device comes in for that. Um, camera roll is photos you've taken in the past, which you can upload. Um, so for the purposes of City Nays Challenge, if you record, say, take photos of 100 things on the uh, Friday, you don't actually have to upload them, um, sorry, on the Friday and then upload them on the Monday. Um, that's absolutely fine. Or if you're doing outside of the challenge, you can take photos whenever you want and then upload them as long as you know what the date is the, and the location that you took those photos. Um, I'm going to skip camera for a second and then no photo. Uh, no photo is if you haven't been able to get a photo of something, say peregrine falcon diving or something, which is just way too fast for you to get a photo, you can still make records that way. So I'm going to click camera now. And then I've got a handy little helper here in the form of an oak tree growing in a pot. So it's as simple as just getting as good a photo as you can. As you can see here, it's got retake and use photo. If you're using an Android, I think that's a cross and a tick symbol um, there. 
So if you got to a really bad photo, you can just take it again. That's fine. And then use that photo. That should come through to a screen that looks something similar to this, where we have uh, at the top, there's this uh, square with a plus symbol in. So that's for um, something where you can take more than one photo of it. So for example, if this was a massive oak tree, not just a sapling that's less than a year old, then, um, and you didn't know what it is, um, you would probably want to get as many photos as possible that, so that someone else can verify that record for you. Um, so in this case, um, you would want to kind of get a close up, say, of its leaf uh, and its berries or its flowers, maybe a shot a few feet away so that you can kind of get an idea of the scale of the tree, that kind of thing. Obviously, that's not always possible if you're doing uh, anything that moves fast, but um, if you can, it's uh, probably best to get a couple of photos. So scrolling down, we got what did you see um, and view suggestions. So you don't actually have to fill in that. We could leave that blank if we wanted, if it was something you don't know what it is. And I'll go through the verifying process of how other people can identify things for you. Um, but in this case, I'm going to click it because also there's a very clever AI software going on in the background that works by what's been seen um, nearby and what is visually similar. Likewise, if you actually know what it is, you can just type it in at the top. Um, and some, sometimes these suggestions can be quite laughable just because of the way the AI software works is, in this example, that oak leaf pattern might look very similar to um, the shape of a butterfly in Peru or something like that. So it might think it's that instead. Um, rarely happens, but just if you do get some of these kind of funny things coming up, it's worth pointing out. Um, you don't have to go down to the species level as well. So for example, here, if I just knew this was some type of uh, oak, walnut or beech tree, not sure which one, you can even record it as that. Likewise, I don't know what species this is. So I'm just going to go down to the genus level on this. Um, so I'm just gonna collect oaks. There's a note section below. So this is most useful if you haven't got a photo. So it's worth here putting a bit um, about if you know if it's a juvenile, if it's injured, if there's any kind of distinctive thing about it that um, says, or if you know the Latin name as well, although it'll record the Latin name up there, and also maybe your name as well, so that if this record is ever used, someone can get in touch to verify it, especially if it's something rare or um, that you don't know about. But for this purposes, you don't need to put anything in if it's just like a photo and you know what it is and it's relatively common. The date and time should come up automatically um, and the location, if you've got your location settings um, on your phone set, um, should come up automatically. However, if you don't, you can just move this around and even search for where you are using this search function here. Sometimes the GPS can be a little off. So say actually, I'm, I live just opposite Castle Park here, so just say it was actually in Castle Park, you can move it around and hit save. Then there's geo privacy, which for the purposes of um, records, we, uh, it's, sorry, start again. For, it tends to be open as a default, which is great. That means that anyone can get hold of that data. Um, and specifically it can be used for like, if people are doing university projects or um, a local park wants to know what is, you know, in that park for um, the rewilding or, um, you know, going forward uh, and what's kind of come over the last couple of months, then um, open record is best. Um, obscured, uh, anything on the protected species list automatically comes through as obscured um, and you can also manually change your record to obscured if there's something that you don't want people to know the exact location of. Um, and then private, which means only you know where that record is, which that's the least useful one. So for the purposes of the challenge, we kind of would like people to have it on open, but if you're worried, feel free to whack it on obscured instead. Is that on open? And then captive or cultivated, which can be a bit of a gray area um, where in its simplest form, this is cats, dogs, um, the cheetahs at the zoo, anything which is obviously introduced into um into the uh local area as such um 
The reason it can get a bit murky is this is technically captive or cultivated at the moment, um, but um, if it was planted and then say 50 years later, how do we know if it's captive or cultivated? So you might not actually know if it is or not, but its default is no, but it's just if you're recording your flatmate or the marigolds that you planted in your garden or something, it's worth putting it through as captive. So I'm gonna put yes on this. Pretty much ignore projects, especially for the next four days, because everything automatically within the Bristol and Bath region will count towards the Bristol and Bath um, region city nature challenge. Um, but you can set up your own projects as well, um, if you'd like to. So I'm just gonna hit share on that. Um, and then as you can see, it's uploading um, to the records I've made. So the way the verification process works is that if I go down to this mallard that was taken in London last year, you can see that there's a little five symbol in this comment box here. And that means that five people have had a discussion about whether I actually did see a mallard or not. So if I scroll down, the way that the grading system on data quality within iNaturalist works is that it has these three grades, casual grade, needs ID and research grade. So casual grade is if I've just taken that photo of the mallard and it's just my word against no one else's. Needs ID would be that if I'd have just uploaded this photo of this duck and no one knows what it is yet because no one's suggested anything. And then research grade, which um, is when a certain amount of people have verified that that is a mallard. For the uh, for the purposes of quite common species, there's kind of a grading system. So, for example, a mallard probably will only need one or two other people to say that it is. Um, when it comes down to things such as like micro moths and stuff, you're probably going to need more like five or six people to agree with that. And that's how, for the research grade side of things, it stops like um, people just saying on quite complicated species to identify. It stops like. Uh, lots of people just suggesting random things, really. And the way that people suggest is they go onto this comment symbol here, um, then scroll down to the bottom, and you can either comment or suggest ID. So sometimes people in the comments, um, for example, here where there's a bit of discussion going on, I initially said it was a mallard, someone changed it to ducks, geese, and swans, someone else suggested mallard, crossed out again, uh, mallard and mallard, but then sometimes you can put a comment in there saying, this is why I think it is a mallard and kind of give a bit of information, which is really helpful for learning for other people. And if you click suggest ID, then you can just type in what you think it is. Uh, um, so that's kind of how people could, um, oh, and when people do that, you'll get a notification in this activity thing here um, in the My Content. So just to say, if you are interested in helping verify other people's records, if you click on Explore, you'll see that these little pins start turning up, and this is everything in the local area. And you can set the map function as to where you would like to see all of like the records coming across. Let's just zoom right out and say all of Bristol and then click on either one of these ones here. And what that would do now is show all the records that are being discovered um, in data order um, in that map area. Uh, so for example, this common slow worm, I could go on and I could put a comment on it. As you can see, two people already have, but I could suggest ID and put in common slow worm there. And that would help get that. Uh, record up um, to research grade, which is great. Um, likewise, you okay, I'm hope, I'm scrolling through this. Hopefully, finding one which just says unknown. Seems like everyone's been very hot on identifying things, but occasionally you'll see with ones which are unknown, and that's where it's useful to um, kind of go in and help get things down. We it is actually also if you're really good with certain things but you don't know exactly what it is it is still helpful to go in and even get it down to like an order level or a genus level as well um because then when it comes to searching through that data after the challenge people can go in and like verify it even down to the species level if possible um so that's how you use it on an uh, on an app um i'll just quickly go through how to use it on the computer as well um Likewise, uh, if you have any questions, please do shout out, put them in the chat. Um, uh, 
and go from there. So the website to head to is inaturalist.org. Um, and this is, you log in using the login that you might have created when you first downloaded the app, or you can just create um, a new login. All you need is your email address and a password that you um, have created. And you should come through to a website that looks something like this, which has uh, various uh, things at the top here. Um, the one that we're um, interested in just for uploading records is this upload button here. So I'm going to click upload. And then it's got choose files. You can use most types of files for this, um, including even spreadsheets. So if you've gone through and done and recording in uh, the paper and pen type method, you just need to get it in a X CXV file. What's the name of the file type? CSV file um, and upload it with all the Latin names um, and locations and stuff filled in. So I'm just going to choose file here, go to my desktop and find a stooge record we've got going, which is a rose chafer. And as you can see, this is a simplified version of the app. You can type in the species name if you want. It comes up with suggestions if you want them to. If you're using just a point and click camera as well um, to get your records um, onto the computer, it won't probably record where the location is um, unless it's a very fancy one. And the date and time might not be correct. So you need to manually put those in. But the location oh, yeah. setting is relatively simple. You just kind of either need to zoom in if you'd like to zoom in or location up here. And then it's just a case of finding where it was taken. Like that. Um, and then cultivation. Again, there's a notes section. And on the left here, there's captive cultivated. And again, that public obscured private thing. Then you click submit one observation. I'm not going to hit submit because I've just made up all those details. And I'm pretty sure this is just a stock photo of Rose Chafer. Um, so I think, yeah, that's pretty much how to make a record using either of um, the computer, if you don't have a smartphone or um, using the smartphone. Um, again, if there's any questions, do put them in the chat there. But I think that's everything. I will hand back to Ellie, unless you've got anything else to add, Ellie. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Unless anyone's got any questions about any, any part of iNaturalist or or about City Nature Challenge. I've got a question about iNaturalist. Um, so the verification, it seems to be just based on people either agreeing or disagreeing without having to have any expertise. Mm -hmm. um, does that lead to any issues? Because I mean, I'm on Reddit um, with a lot of their, uh, you know, what is this X um, thing? And you c will get people asserting quite vociferously that something is something that it completely cannot be. Yeah. So the way that that works best really is it is kind of checks and balances in terms of it wouldn't, um, it can, it's open to kind of people being um, very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What I mean is like, I I could go onto this orange tip record, for example, and just say, I didn't think that was an orange tip. And I went on there and then disagreed saying, definitely not an orange tip. This is actually a elephant and can put that in as, you know, what I think it is. And because of I've disagreed with that, then it might lose its research grade um, status down at the bottom there. So it means that the records which are most useful are those research grade um, things casual grades it could still be useful because you know we can then see how many numbers of people are actually out there recording um in Bristol and Bath which is an interesting you know different type of statistic but um the actual stuff that will probably be used at some point will be research grade so it's based very much off on like that one person's word against another but you need to have a certain amount of agreement and you will see some of these, there's long threads of people kind of going, is this, is this, no, is this, is this, is this, is, you know, like really kind of disagreement. Yeah. And that's 
eventually, you know, it will kind of get to a point where there will either be an agreement or there won't be. And if there isn't, then that's not the end of the world. It just means that record won't be used or, it, you know, you can end up with like 10 people versus two. So those 10 people are probably more likely right than the two people. Yeah. In short, I think, you know, there is obviously there's room for error there, but it's not so open for error that, you know, there's there's not a certain amount of balance going on there as well. I mean, obviously, for things like Orange Tip, it's pretty obvious that you're dealing with. I mean, obviously, the females are a little bit more iffy, um, but on things like where there's a lot of um, closely related species, like I'm trying to get my head around uh, buttercups mm -hmm. and trying to work out whether I've got a meadow, meadow buttercup or a bulbous buttercup or, or, you know, whatever is really hard. And I mean, I, I just, I, I have some worries that, you know, no, you of course, strongly asserted, um, you know, and then you get onto insects where you need to do dissections of genitals to be able to work mm. out which one you've got. And I just sometimes worry that, you know, the app gives you a very definitive, yes, this is what you're seeing and you get people yeah. agreeing. And it's like, well, actually, unless you've got out your, you know, your hand lens or your microscope, I, I've, I just worry that it sometimes gives you a false sense of um, security in what you're seeing. No, of course. And I, I'm bringing up this blue. Oh, sorry, Ali. I'm bringing up this bluebells just as an example here where the thing that this app is best at, you know, the reason that we're encouraging people to use this app, say, rather than like I record or kind of um, uh, recording just using like books and stuff is that it's the best kind of like public engagement tool that there is out there for this kind of thing in terms of a gateway into finding out more about something. And I brought up this bluebells as an example here where it's only brought up to the genus level you know like it's kind of it's sometimes especially with insects i think it's very recognizable that it's very difficult to as you said you have to cut open the genitals basically to get like the right um thing which is um you're never going to get that just with a you know any camera no matter how good it is um unless you are an expert so some and it will go up to the order instead, like hoverflies or something like that. Um, and you can often tell the people who are going to be a bit more um, on it when it comes to like these photos where, I mean, for starters, there's faces that become quite recognisable as people who are very good at stuff, but also, you know, they've got this measurement tool um, there. So, there, yeah, I think, you know, there is room for error there but then what you know if this is where it's useful to have experts in the background who are actually doing the verification side of things as well so that um with that going back to that example of the mallard there someone moved my record initially up to just general ducks and geeses and stuff went back up to the order level rather than saying that's the species um so are there like recognized experts on different taxa that can override because if you've got you know one expert saying no it's actually this thing and you've got 10 other people who don't really know that tax are saying no it's the other thing will the mm. expert get priority over that or mm. no they won't no right. um no but really i mean useful feature. sorry Stu. no go on ellie sorry um, another really useful feature and it's a really interesting i mean it's it doesn't go against what Stu just said um but interesting feature and good learning tool is that when you make a suggestion, you can make comments. So if somebody is disagreeing with that with um, an ID and is particularly knowledgeable, they're likely to point out why they've disagreed or why they've said something else, which is really helpful. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I hope that answered your question, Sarah. Yeah, no, I'm so sorry, I just um, yeah, didn't want to dominate the conversation. No, no, <laughs> not at all, Sarah. No, honestly, they, these are exactly the kind of questions which are really useful because otherwise, you know, like, um, yeah. And I think uh, I'm just going to drop into the chat anyway, just because of I imagine there's lots of knowledgeable people here just kind of about the data as well, um, which is a really useful document just kind of explaining how our naturalist data works and how it works within the UK picture. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions that anybody had? No. 
I don't think so. Um, so I've got a couple more slides, but I am going to wrap up. I will be very quick because I know we, we're getting um, very near half past 11. Um, but I just wanted to um, share with you um, some information we can send and also our email address as well. Um, oh, that's not helpful. There we go. Um, so just a reminder of the dates, although it's over the next four days, and this is the UK website if you want to take a look at that. Um, we are also able to send out um, resources if that's helpful to you. So we want to encourage as many people as possible to take part. Um, and we have a pack which I'll send at the end of at the end of this session that's got um, digital posters in case anybody wants to put them up in their local area. Um, how to guides, also some social media posts in case you would like to share them. And these are our, this is our social media um, handle. So we're at Best of Nature on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And we'll be doing lots of posts um, over the four days and sharing lots of um, data stories um, and other stories of what's happening across our region. Uh, so if you are out and about during say Did You Nature Challenge and you would like to share what you're up to, um, please do tag us in. And also we have a UK hashtag and also this hashtag City Niche Challenge is the global hashtag as well. So if you wanted to have a look at what's happening in South Africa, for example, you can um, keep your eyes on that hashtag. Um, and a final note um, to say a thank, thank you for our, to our funders. So we've had some funding from Postcode Local Trust who um, are supporting us to organise the City Nature Challenge in Bristol and Bath. So um, thank you very much to them. Um, and thank you to everybody that's, um, that's come along today. I hope it's been useful. A huge thank you to Jen. That was really interesting and so useful to hear about your, your work at Wild Place. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ellie. And we will drop our email address in the chat to, um, actually, I will put it on the follow-up email so that you can um, get in touch if you have any questions or if, you, um, um, if you'd like to get in touch with Jen as well through us, then please do 